up on your computer, just confirming that you're okay with still being in the meeting while it's recording. And with that, Jonathan Israel, I think we are ready to go. It is over to you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the CEHD Town Hall meeting with Interim Dean Amy Lingo. My name is Jonathan Israel, and I serve as the Director of Development for the College of Education and Human Development. And with that, I want to take a little bit of time just to tell you thank you. Thank you for all that you do for our college. We really appreciate you. We thank you for your time. We thank you for your advice and comments and so forth. And most certainly, we thank you for your financial contribution to the university. Uh, even in uh, the times we were in through COVID, social injustice, the College of Education did uh, um, surpass its, its fundraising goal for the year. So that's, uh, that's, that's great. That's, uh, but we owe that all to you. So thank you very much. Um, today's town hall is also one of the many in the University of Louisville's Alumni Association's ongoing efforts to provide virtual engagement opportunities. So we thank them for uh, allowing us this platform to, to engage with our alumni, friends, and donors, and we encourage you to visit their website uh, as there are many other opportunities for you to engage, uh, uh, engage with the University of Louisville and our college. So in today's conversation, Dean Lingo will provide updates on the CEHD's ongoing response to COVID-19 pandemic and our plans for safely providing instruction this fall. She'll also do some updates on departmental programs uh, and their response to COVID-19. She will also speak to the CEHD's response to social injustice in our communities and our college's renewed commitment to all of our students. Um, lastly, the Dean will provide you with a brief college update, including some points of pride. And as Mary Ann said, at the conclusion of the presentation, we'll address your questions. So please submit your questions to the chat room. I think you can send them to the host as well, but uh, if you want to remain anonymously, but the, uh, the chat room is just fine. Um, knowing that you can ask any question you want to, we may not have all the answers, but this is why we're going to have a conversation today. So we do appreciate you being here this afternoon. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean Amy Lingo. Okay. Well, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you to everyone who's joining us today. I see lots of familiar names, and it just really um, it is great to see you all and knowing that you took time out of your busy schedule to, uh, to join us today. Um, I am um, excited to share some of the changes and um, just to share with you that our faculty and staff at the in the college they have just done an amazing job of preparing um, to welcome our students in just about three weeks. So we are very excited about the fall semester. We know that with the fall semester, there comes lots of uncertainty, um, but we will, um, I will talk more about that later on in the presentation. So just to give you an overview of, of the 30 minutes or so that I'm gonna talk with you, I will be providing some college updates. Um, I will be sharing some information that you may find interesting about our student perspectives that we uh, conducted a survey at the end of the spring semester, just about how students, their perspective around switching to this online format, were the, um, did they have a good experience? What were their ex um, expectations moving forward? So I think that you will find that interesting and in how we have really taken that data and what the, the student voices and have really worked with our faculty and staff in determining what our fall semester would look like. And then with that, I'll explain to you a little bit about what our fall semester looks like because um, out in the community and with everyone that I talk to, they are very interested um, in, in thinking about the university as a whole and in particular, what our college will look like in the fall semester. I'll provide some uh, uh, program updates, some new programs that we are uh, beginning uh, this fall semester. And then uh, we'll talk about uh, the diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives that we have going on. And then moving forward over this next year, what um, our goals are um, for, for the college. Um, so with that, I'd like to begin by providing just some, an overview, and many of you have uh, heard about uh, this before, that we are the home of five academic departments. So those of you who were here five, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that may be different than what you had when you were here. So I will talk about 
those five departments. We had the Department of Counseling and Human Development, which houses school counseling, our mental health counseling program, master's program, and PhD program. We have Health and Sports Sciences, which houses our sport administration program, exercise physiology, and our health and PE certification program. We have elementary, middle, and secondary teacher education, um, which houses middle and middle school certification, secondary certification, and um, a shared program with another department in uh, elementary education. We have educational leadership, evaluation, and organizational development, which has uh, human resources, organizational leadership and learning. It is where our education, um, educator administration program is, school principal, and so forth. Um, we also have my home department, the Department of Special Education, Early Childhood and Prevention Science. So it also has the IECE, LBD certification, MSD certification, our BCBA autism programs are within that department as well. So we do have about over 3,000 students in our college. We have 80 degree programs. These include extensions, endorsements, and rank programs within our teacher educator education um, areas. We have 11 accreditations, including COSMA, which is a sport administration, KCREP, which is a counseling, our CAPE accreditation. We also share accreditations with our School of Music um, and a social work uh, certification as well. We have six partnership schools in and around uh, or in the, in the Louisville area. We have five centers, including the Kentucky Autism Training Center. We have the Center for Instructional Behavior and Research in School Cybers, which is led by Dr. Terry Scott. So those are just some of the centers that we have. We do have two university service units. We have the Roush Planetarium and the Early Learning Campus, or the ELC, which is also a service unit that is part of our college. We have 93 full-time faculty, about 168 part-time faculty, and in 2018-19, we did have 921 graduates. So that's a number that we really are very proud of. So in a, um, our enrollment, I've, I've been getting a lot of questions out in the community uh, about what does our enrollment look like? Um, well, for this summer, we actually had um, higher enrollment than we had last summer in 2019. So, and that is with credit hour production and just the number of students that were taking classes. So we were very excited to see this and this really helped mitigate some of the financial um, issues that, that we were perhaps face, facing because we really didn't know um, how many um, uh, how many students were going to actually be coming um, to um, to to the universities this summer. So yes, I'm very excited about that. Um, in addition to, I want to go back to the previous slide. In addition to that, 98 faculty members. I neglected to say that we have 160, um, about a hundred, a little over a hundred staff that are in our college as well. So we would not be able to do the work that we do and serve our students without that, um, without our staff support. So um, that they are very instrumental and the, really the backbone of our college. So um, with that, for our fall semester, we are also very optimistic about the fall semester. We have, um, a, a, again, an increase in the number of students that are attending. Um, we have those students that are taking more credit hours, so that's exciting. So you can see the, the information on the screen there. And what's really exciting is we have a larger number of first-time, first-year students that are coming. And I think this is primarily in the area of teaching and learning. So those of you who have followed education and have, um, over the last several years, we have seen a decrease in the number of students that are interested in pursuing teaching or education as a career. And so I, I feel like now just with in the fall at U of L anyway, we're starting to see more students that are expressing interest. I think that is due in part to a uh, 
building a pipeline for high school students, particularly the teaching and learning pathway. We have a large number of dual credit students that we're strategically trying to recruit into the teaching profession. And I think the state is really kind of taking a turn and is really investing in education and is really trying to, um, to, to Know, knows the importance and is investing in that way. So that's that's very exciting. So we're we're optimistic about the fall semester, although there's a great deal of uncertainty. The numbers that we're seeing and, and our interactions with especially first time first year students um, gives us great hope. So in order to prepare um, for the fall semester, um, we have, we did a survey, the student government actually did the survey and then we um, disaggregated the data and looked specifically at students that were going, that were uh, uh, in our college. And so we had, there was 13,000, a little over 13,000 um, was surveys that were distributed with a response rate of about 26%, which was really quite good um, for, for, sur for survey data. And so some of the things that CEHD students particularly said was their experience from that spring semester was that the 77% of them did say they were satisfied or very satisfied with how CEHD faculty transition courses to remote instruction in the spring. And really they did this very quickly. I mean, when we made the decision in mid-March, when actually U of L was on um, spring break to extend spring break for two days, and then all classes thereafter were going to be online, that was a big lift for many of our faculty. So this gave me great pride in that 77% of our students said they were satisfied or very satisfied with that. 89% said that thought that CEHD faculty communicated effectively or very effectively for the remainder part of that spring 2020 semester. So again, faculty um, really and, and instructors really stepped up and were really student focused, particularly at the end of that spring semester. I love this quote and um, I, I thought that I would share this uh, with you all. Um, this student said, for the record, I will always prefer my education in a classroom setting. I hope that once this COVID-19 is over, I hope the university continues in class lectures. But the way Blackboard was used, it was easy to transition to the online setting. So I think that that spoke to the fact that faculty really had to, as we all have on this call, have really had to up their technology skills and really figure out a new way in which we could do things like teach and reach our students. Um, so with that, um, given that that's what happened in, this, in the spring semester and given the uncertainty of what we don't know what the fall semester, how long we will be able to stay in person, if that's gonna be throughout the semester, we know that because of the Kentucky Derby and others that we are going to have some days of online instruction. What we did was we really encouraged all of our faculty, including me, um, because I will be teaching this fall, we encouraged all of our faculty to take part in a Delphi Center training in order to enhance their technology skills particularly with hybrid and online instruction. Because again, our commitment to providing our students a high quality educational experience, whether that's in this hybrid format or whether that's in an online format, that commitment is still there. And the expectation is, is that our faculty will deliver high quality instruction. So we have been participating in webinars around best practices. We've been doing some learning communities within departments in order to help prepare one, one another uh, for what the fall semester will bring. So with that, um, we put some, we did, we've, uh, the university um, established a pivot to fall committee that had representatives from across the university that would make decisions about how the university would return to campus. I think it is important to know that the University of Louisville did never shut down. We never uh, weren't open, if you will. We transitioned to remote work and we transitioned to remote instruction. 
So now we have transitioned back to campus, right? So now our work is transitioning back to campus. Our faculty and staff were always working. Um, mostly harder than they ever have had to work before because they've had to completely change the way in which they do things. So, so with that, the university established this pivot to fall committee. Within our college, we also established some three, three separate committees. And some of the logistics that we had to think about were things like our mask and disinfectant products, how are we gonna provide those? How will those be easily accessible? Who's gonna be responsible for medical screening and monitoring? How will the university manage high traffic areas? Thinking about the bus transportation from parking lots to campus, um, social area seating. How will dining look um, at the university? How will we, how and to whom will we report non-compliant behavior around wearing masks? Because, and with, um, again, always following government or governor, um, the state of Kentucky and um, national guidelines around that. So that was some of the logistics. So we at, in the College of Ed established three separate subcommittees, one that would focus on the student experience. And I challenged that committee to think about what if students do not want to attend in-person class? Right, so what if we have students that may be um, immunocompromised or they just don't feel comfortable, maybe they're caring for someone who is in a vulnerable population. So how are we gonna be accommodating to those students? How will advisors facilitate meetings with students? What are the students' expectations of faculty? Um, and I will tell you that I had a uh, student town hall similar to this last night. And one of the things that became very clear to me, and I'm, I'm, I was so glad to, to see many and staff attend that as well, and students are really um, anxious about the fall semester and I think primarily because they want to make sure they want to have some assurance that faculty will be understanding. It will be a day they become ill or if they have to take care of someone that gets the virus. So it became very obvious last night to me in that town hall that um, students are very anxious and very um, scared. Um, so the faculty experience uh, was another subcommittee. Um, it was um, how will modifications to teaching be reflected in the work plan. So we know that given this hybrid type of format, that it's going to be more work on faculty and on the instructor. Because many times if we have reduced number of students in class and that other, the other set of students or the a number of students are, are getting the content online, then that those, that faculty member is having to provide in-person in instruction and remote instruction. And we um, have been able to, to secure some cameras for live streaming and so forth, but we haven't been able to get the needed number because again, as you all would imagine, is that every university in the country and every college in the country is wanting that type of technology. And so um, course sizes, how should they be reduced and accommodate for um, social distancing? So those were all questions that the subcommittees um, were, were thinking about. And finally, the logistics subcommittee, I think that that's on the next slide. Um, we're thinking about, again, how are, what are we gonna do if, someone, if a student forgets their mask? How will we provide that to them? Again, who's responsible for making sure that our building is, um, has social distancing guidelines and the traffic flow and so forth. So again, these logistic committees really, this logistic committee in particular worked uh, tirelessly to make sure that our classrooms met the physical distancing requirements, that hallways, restrooms, and so forth. So we are offering three methods of delivery for our students. 
Um, there is a hybrid delivery model and all of these are noted on the student's schedule. So for example, when you register for your class, then it will indicate whether it's a hybrid course, a distance education course or a remote course. So a hybrid course is where that 25 to 75% of the course is taught face to face with the remaining that's taught online. Okay, so this would be that students would have the option of coming in person, making sure that the guidelines with social distancing and so forth and the classroom capacity, those guidelines are adhered to, but then that the content will also be delivered online. Distance education is 100% of digital instruction. There's no, there will be no de designated meeting time except possibly for exams. But basically this is asynchronous, meaning that it, you, will, you would log in at your convenience or at the student's convenience and um, get, their, get your assignments and do that work without having to be there at a certain time. Remote instruction is that 100% of this instruction will be synchronous sessions. Meaning that if I had class on a Monday night from 4.30 to 7, I would need to log in to um, Blackboard from 4.30 to 7 on that Monday night. Faculty are being strongly encouraged to record all of those sessions because we know that if someone is ill or if the student, you know, life happens, that students should be, have the option to join asynchronously as well. So those are the different, th the different delivery methods of our courses this fall semester. So you can see that uh, we, are, we have had to reduce classroom capacity, again, to adhere to the guidelines. This did, as I, as I said earlier, increase the need for classroom technology. And we've had a greater emphasis on course delivery strategies and techniques. So you can see that we have made allowed for eight feet between the instructor and where the students are and then how we've tried to arrange or we have arranged by measuring out where students would particularly sit in within the classroom. You can see that our building and how classrooms look vastly different than they have before. So you can see that, um, that our lobby, the picture on the left side of the screen is our lobby. And you can see how we have, again, allowed for the social distancing, physical distancing guidelines and have re it's really opened up to allow for that to occur. The, on the right is a classroom um, that would probably typically seat about 40. And so you can see how we've measured that out and have reduced the capacity for that classroom. You can see that we've already put in place signage indicating which hallways are one way um, and there's signage on the floor as well, which I'm sure many of you have seen if you've gone into um, any retail store um, in the last couple of months. We've also, um, as I mentioned earlier, have also put signage in our restrooms, have closed off certain sinks just so that we can again allow for those physical distancing guidelines. Um, the Gein's uh, Roush uh, Planetarium has been temporarily closed, um, and uh, that is uh, because we know that it has, we have reduced, it's greatly reduced the services that's offered there. Um, you know, typically there are summer camps in the planetarium. There are um, individuals, school groups that would come in and camps in the summer. They host camps. Uh, themselves or they are the site of some camps that would come there and so that is temporarily that has temporarily been closed. Our early learning campus opened uh, just last Monday July 13th um, at the capacity established by the governor for daycare centers and so I know that Jill I think she is on this call and so we have um, students are back our children are back um, and uh, we are so excited to welcome to we were excited to welcome them and so we will be following state guidelines um, in order to get that back up to capacity but parents were uh, were ready to send uh, some of us, so we are at capacity. So parents are ready for their children to interact with others and to be back within that setting. So, um, and you, if you all have heard President Bendapudi talk, 
she talks a lot about the cardinal principles. And at this time, and in the last uh, three um, or last five months, um, we have relied on the cardinal principles to really guide us in how we respond to the virus, to the societal issues um, and political issues that, that we're facing. And one that really comes to my mind um, are two, you know, the community of care. And we have stressed that uh, to our faculty and staff. And uh, we will be stressing that to our students. And, and we talked about this last night in the town hall, that we are a community of care. And that means that we take care of one another. And that means that we're going to be practicing, I know this sounds elementary, but we're going to be practicing good hygiene. We're going to be, you know, requiring masks because that's what it takes in order for us to take care of one another. And we have a renewed commitment to diversity and inclusion. We want to make sure that our college is a place that all feel like they belong. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit uh, a, a more later. So we are definitely a community of care with diversity and inclusion being at the, at the, at the center of, of what we do. So with that, just some updates that I would like to provide um, is that one of the, th the things that, that has become very apparent to me is the mental and emotional well-being of our students are, is of critical importance. So I have been very vocal about how important our student, our student success model is. We want to make sure that we have increased our enrollment. Right, we have done, and last year I was about, we need to attract, attract, attract students to U of L. And we've been able to do that. And we have seen increases in enrollment in, in a lot of, in some key areas that will benefit not only Louisville, but our, the Commonwealth as well. But with that, we know that we need, once our students come to U of L, and in particular our college, we have to take care of them once they get here. And that means that we're going to be providing resources around their mental and emotional well being. And that shouldn't just be isolated, but we really want to make sure that that programming about what students' emotional, the mental and emotional well being, how we can infuse that um, across all of our programs. So with that, I'm, uh, we are in uh, hiring a mental health coordinator. Currently, the, the, the search is underway. And this person would really act as a resource, not only to our students, but to our faculty and staff as well. So they would be referring students to other mental health services. They would help our faculty know about trauma-informed care, know about what they would not be they would not be telling faculty to diagnose students in particular ways, but really serving as a resource for our faculty and staff and for our students in connecting them to the services that will help them be successful. So they will address students' concerns and needs and inform the decision-making process and moving forward, ensuring that we do meet students' mental and emotional well-being. So that's one example. Uh, exciting uh, student resource that we're providing. Some of the other resources that I'm going to talk about are the Cardinal Success Program, which is in West Louisville, uh, the Louisville Teacher Residency, which is um, my favorite thing in the world to talk about. Um, we're also going to talk about the Multicultural Teacher Recruitment Program, which is vital um, within our college in and in diversifying the teacher workforce. We're going to talk about graduate student success, and the Office of Undergraduate Student Success as well. So the Cardinal Success Program is um, a program that provides mental health counseling in West Louisville. So currently they serve about 158 um, clients. There are 16 graduate student clinicians. The average client age is around 27. And then what's amazing about this is that 20%, some of the data that we have 20% of the clients reported improvement in client relationships, which, it, which is great. The end, this uh, it, Cardinal Success Program, there was one at Shawnee High School. We're not sure that that one's going to be operational um, yet. I mean, it's already been operational, but given that Jefferson County is doing remote instruction or NTI for the first six weeks, 
We are fully open at the NIA Center, which is, which is also in West Louisville. So again, this is providing a great impact and a, a great service to our residents in West Louisville. The next program that I'll talk about is the Louisville Teacher Residency Program. This is a great partnership between us, Class Act Federal Credit Union, and Jefferson County Public Schools. Um, so we have uh, recruited and um, 35 teachers um, of color um, that will be residents for the upcoming academic year in Jefferson County. 29 of those individuals received a class act scholarship and they will be referred to as the class act scholars and we are so grateful for the support of class act in supporting this important initiative which whose the goal of this uh, program is to diversify and to get more teachers of color in Jefferson County Public Schools, but also these teachers, these residents, when they're teacher, when they become teachers and they will receive their master's degree after one year, these teachers are committed to serving in a high need school for five years. So we have a very robust coaching model uh, led by Dr. Stephanie Wooten Burnett. And so we are very excited about this program. They have been in classes since June. We, are, we, hope, we hope we will be honoring them in a couple of weeks at a reception. So we are again, very excited about this partnership. And this is the first residency program in the Commonwealth. There are some other national models. And so we are very excited about the residency program. And it's a true partnership between a school district and a, and a business that is very engaged with the community and has that as its central mission. So again, we're very, we're very proud of this. And then MTRP, the Multicultural Teacher Recruitment Program. Again, in 2019, 2020, we had 26 um, MTRP scholars. 19 of those were undergraduates. Seven of them were receiving their Master's of Arts in Teaching. Three graduated last fall, four in the spring, and their average GPA was 3.45. So we are very excited about this program. This is led by Sherry Durham, um, and she is doing a phenomenal job. And you can see that again, the ethnicity of the participants in the program, 77% are African-American, 11% um, are Asian. So I think that we really are trying to ensure that the children in Jefferson County and the surrounding areas, um, that they have a, um, a someone that looks um, in many cases like they do so that they can see role models and others. And we know that it benefits not only um, children of color, but all children to have a, a, someone teaching them um, from a diverse background. So we're very excited about that. And then we, our Graduate Student Success Office um, is, um, has been, when, when I became the interim dean, well, what seems like 13 years ago, but it was only like, I don't even remember, 16 months ago. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Um, I do love my job. The, graduate, the Office of Graduate Student Success um, was, we did have an Education Advising and Student Services Office, um, and that was had both undergraduate and graduate programs and admissions and advising within that. And so I knew that graduate students are a, are a unique population with specific needs. So I I divided that um, office up into a graduate student office and an undergraduate office, again, to focus on the unique needs of those respective learners. So the graduate student success office um, really is a one-stop shop for graduate students in terms of they can coordinate the admissions process, make sure that graduate students get connected with the correct faculty member within their area of expertise or in, within their area of interest. It's where our graduate assistantship happens and so forth. So it's a very, um, it's, it's a great, it's a great office that really provides a community for graduate students. And our undergraduate office, um, again, focuses on 2100 undergraduate students with eight advisors. Um, we have had a 4% increase in undergraduate credit uh, hour production over the past year. 
our, we have our retention rate is 80% for first time first year students. And this is an area which I am uh, committed to improving. Um, I want our retention rate to be in the 90s. I mean, I, we, once we, we do such a great job of recruiting in the last year or so, I really want to figure out what we can do to retain. Our 43% four year undergraduate, undergraduate graduation rate is 6% higher than the UofL average. And our six year undergraduate graduation rate is 5% higher at 64% than the UofL average. So again, we are committed to providing a student success framework and supports to address the needs of our undergraduate students. So over the next year, we will be flushing that model out and implementing programming to address uh, some of the areas that I have already discussed. Um, a lot, there have been a lot of questions um, around the community around what we're going to do about student teaching, what we're going to do about field placements for our teacher education candidates. Um, we know that the, the, the good news is, is that we've been working closely. I've been working closely with other deans of uh, education, of schools of education and colleges of education across Kentucky so that we can have a unified voice as we collaborate with the Kentucky Department of Education and the Educational Professional Standards Board. So we know that student teachers will work with their cooperating teachers to plan and deliver NTI lessons and instructions. We are going to have give them access and they're going to get access to the online platforms that JCPS and many other districts are using, such as Google Suite, that they're going to have opportunities to work with their cooperating teachers prior to the first day of school. Um, methods and field experiences. Um, we are looking at non-traditional observation and experiences, and if possible, maybe some live streaming within classrooms. So uh, right now, department chairs, assistant chairs, and faculty that teach courses with um, field experiences associated with those courses, what they are doing is really looking for um, whether that's videos through the National Board Certified Teacher video library, just to really to think about what are some experiences and observations of how we can connect um, students that are that in their courses, making sure that they see the relevant observations and those relevant experiences. So we are currently working on that. And now that we know a little bit more about what districts are going to do, that makes that process a little easier for us to, to try to navigate. And again, we're making sure that those experiences align with course requirements. Um, I do want to talk about, you all may have seen uh, Dr. Doug Craddock and Dr. Randy Whetstone on the, uh, on the news. They have a black male equity network, which is really a way in which they can have a community of black males, um, although uh, Doug says to me, it's open to anyone, um, but just where they can have frank conversations about some of the barriers that, uh, that black males may face um, within higher education, and this is for individuals that are pursuing doctoral degrees. We have individuals that uh, participate from Bellarmine, from Spalding, and so from a, um, a lot of different um, universities. So this is just something that we're very excited about and that we are, we are honored to um, host and to connect others with. Um, so um, President Ben DePuty, um earlier um, and uh, talked about um, and, I and I love this quote from her um, about diversity, equity, and inclusion. So just as the message that they were free did not reach some of the enslaved populations in Texas for two and a half years, I wonder, have we all received the message? Do we get the memo that the daily insults, the indignities, the microaggressions, all the way to the killings and murders have to stop? We are one human family and it is time for us to act that way. And that has never been more apparent um, than right now and in, um, in 2020. So um, one of the things that we're doing um, is that we are um, in under the, um, the, with the diversity committee and um, with Dr. Doug Craddock is that we're going to be looking at 
how we infuse anti-racist curriculum within and across all of our academic programs. So this has become, this is gonna be one of our goals for this coming year, um, is that we are going to really focus on how do we become a more equitable, diverse and inclusive college. And so, um, and that starts with the message um, that I send and, and, and what I stand for. So that's going to be one of our, just one of our initiatives as we go into the, this coming academic year. So in 2021 and beyond, so, um, and, and this was good timing because my goals are due to the provost like within the next day or two. So again, we are going to, in terms of learn, as you all know, President Bendapudi, her strategic plan for the university is in three areas, a great, becoming a, or a great place to learn, a great place to work, and a great place to invest. And in terms of learn, again, we're gonna continue to focus on our student success framework, which I had talked um, about earlier, with an emphasis on the retention of undergraduate students. We do want to revise and develop academic programs to meet industry and workforce demand. And we've started on this because the Louisville Teacher Residency is a great example of doing this. And then we're going to be integrating the anti-race curriculum across all programs in collaboration with our faculty and staff. In terms of work, um, hire more faculty of color in tenure track positions. And again, this speaks to my desire to have sustainable diversity that will occur um, for years to come. And in order to do that, we need more faculty of color in those tenure track positions. So again, a goal of mine. I wanna to continue to strengthen the culture and the climate within the college to, prom to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in terms of invest, we want to develop impactful community partnerships to promote research. Dr. Jeff Sun has already been working with some industry partners in getting us to do this. We want to increase the percentage of alumni giving, enhance our stewardship with alumni, and then again, communicating and developing the advancement priorities based on the critical needs within the college. So that's really what I'm going to submit as my goals. So I would love any feedback from you all about whether you think I'm on the right track or not. So that would be that would be helpful as I start going through this. So again, I'll let uh, Jonathan um, kind of facilitate some of the questions maybe that I've been getting. I can see one. Uh, what has been learned through this experience that may continue after COVID? You know, that's a great question, uh, Linda. I think that one of the things that I hope that faculty and staff have learned is that how we have to be flexible and we have to be accommodating with whatever our students may need. So if our students need remote instruction or they need some type of flexibility in how we deliver content to them, I hope that we now know that that's possible that we can do that. So and I think that's one of the things, I, I just became president of the Kentucky Association of Colleges for Teacher Education. And I think that one of the things that I said to the membership of that organization a month or so ago was that I know and we all recognize that this has been a season of change. And some of the change hasn't been pleasant. I mean, I think you could ask my children that it probably, it has not been pleasant for them to be a 12 year old and a 13 year old and be home, not having a soccer season, not being able to go to school to see their friends socially, not being able to do whatever preteen or teenagers do, right? But we also have to think about what are, what's the good that can come out of this? What can we, focus on that's positive that we can that can carry us forward despite whatever's going on around us and I'm hoping it's this flexibility this willingness to accommodate and to make a tough situation work so Jonathan I didn't mean just to to take you off um, or not or just talk or to take that question but oh, no 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 uh, thank you uh, if anybody wants to submit a question, you can do it in the chat room, or if you'd like to speak, just type comment, we'll recognize you, and then you can uh, you may make a comment. And I know that I talked way longer than I should have, so I apologize for that. 
Uh, we have a question, how will the university, university promote anti-racist teaching? How will white allies promote social justice on campus? Well, I think that one of the things that the, the president's senior leadership uh, team is doing is that we are doing a book study on, on anti-racism and in particular about around what that look, what actions look like within, um, with, within our daily lives. Um, so um, we will be doing that at the, so the university is gonna be doing that at the university level. And then in particularly within our college, um, I will be relying heavy, heavily on the diversity committee and the curriculum committee um, and um, that has faculty and staff representation on those so that we can really think about what do we, what actions do we need to take do we need to take? And then um, how will we hold others accountable when um, there are these um, indignities and microaggressions that, that may occur? And I believe we have a comment that adds on to that. The alumni office will be launching a diversity series soon. I'm sure that's an opportunity for engagement. Uh, Dr. Barber, Dr. Barber has a question for me, which, oh, oh, which always makes me nervous because he always, I always feel like he is going to be the principal to say, how are you helping build leadership among your team focused on a sense of belonging and inclusivity? Uh, that's a great question. One of the things that I am so proud of is the diversity of my leadership team. Um, so, um, I have um, representation of various ethnicities. I have representation of LGBTQ. So I am so proud of that. And I know that just by having individuals around me and helping me lead that have different perspectives from my own helps me be a stronger leader. So, um, so with that, um, I think that, I, and, and I also have to say that I welcome um, opinions that are different from mine. So, and I think that's also been very helpful for me um, in, as I have thought about how to develop and, and what I need to do for my leadership team. So I have a very diverse leadership team, probably one of the most diverse leadership teams around across the university. So I don't know if that answered your question, Dr. Barber, but you and I can talk offline if you need a more specific answer or if you need me to write a dissertation about that. That's the bad thing about these Zoom meetings. Like you, you try to use humor and you never really know if it's working. <laughs> there was another Thank question. Thank you, Jonathan, for laughing. Yeah. Okay, Houston's laughing too. Okay. Um, another question was, how do we promote a work of a the work of our alumni that are out in the community? And I think we do that mostly uh, if you submit it to the alumni office or the alumni association's website, uoflalumni.org. I think there's a news and notes section. And also, you can communicate directly to myself or Megan Little Case, who's on this call. She's the communications director for the or College of Education. So, as long as you get it to us, we like to share good news stories on our social media platforms. I think you see a section in our U of L magazine where we honor alumni. We talk about uh, new cardinal babies and different things like that. So, whatever information you have about our alumni that are doing well out in the community, please submit that to myself or the alumni office or Megan. Um, Lois Adams Rogers, uh, how can members of our advisor committee and other alumni support these efforts, Dr. Mingo? Oh, great. Well, and I know that many of you have so given me so much support, whether that's moral support, whether that's financial support through our emergency student um, scholarship fund through, I know that there have been many scholarship uh, funds that are established. So I would just say, continue to do what you do. Please provide me with honest feedback. Um, I want our college to be successful. I want our faculty and staff to be successful. I want our students to be success successful because they will be going out into the community in professions. So I want that more than anything. So your suggestions, your feedback is how you can continue to help me lead. Tough crowd here. Yeah, I know. 
Uh, Kathy Sides, I think I saw a news article this past week about a very cool virtual reality tool that is helping to facilitate student teaching in CEHD. Could you tell us more about this? I believe a PhD student in CEHD was very instrumental in this. Oh, great. Um, so, um, that so sh so this came from the the uh, this the virtual reality from it's Dr. or Shannon Putnam and Dr. John Finch they were um have been instrumental in Cochrane Elementary here in Jefferson County it was our was the first virtual lab school or vir had a virtual lab in their school and this again provides students the opportunities to never leave the school yet experience places and in reality situations that they may not have had otherwise so it's um it's a really interesting and so we've transitioned using that to um methods instruction so uh, or for teacher candidates so for example i participated in a social studies methods course where we were uh, i was an avatar we were in a virtual reality room yet the professor was giving us the instruction within this virtual reality it was super cool and we were could interact and do really cool things so she, uh, Shannon Putnam is, is the graduate assistant, assistant that's interested in this area. She's going to be doing her student teaching on student engagement in virtual reality classrooms. So it's, 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 it is a really cool, um, it's a really cool, so we really want to know though, does it impact student achievement? We know it's cool, but do students learn better? Do they achieve more um, through, through this mechanism? I did think of another way, Lois, that, that members of the advisory committee um, and how other alumni could support these efforts. I have charged every department with establishing, establishing their own individual advisory boards. So, for example, the elementary, middle, and teacher education department, secondary teacher education department, would have an advisory board that would, con that would consider um, advising them particularly on those areas within students with those areas sport administration their own advisory board etc so I think this is a way in which alumni could get involved and give back to um, U of L and to the college I will still have my overall College of Education and Human Development Advisory Board but this gives a, a broader um, number of individuals to uh, to be involved Are there any other questions or comments for the Dean? Well, I can tell you all, I appreciate so much that, of, that you all taking time out of your, of your day to spend this hour with me. This was really fun. I, I have, this is the thing about this virus. I have missed interacting with people, if you all can't tell. I mean, I have missed it so much. I mean, this is, uh, this really energizes me is when I can talk with and, and um, especially alumni and those that want to support our college. So this was by far my the favorite thing. Don't tell anybody else. One of the, my, my favorite things that I've done in a while, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, we missed one question. That was, are, are there any openings for biology professors? <laughs> biology teachers? I'm sure there are. There's a STEM area. I think uh, Will or Houston could probably help me with this. I think if you go to the Kentucky Educator Placement Service, is it KEPS still, that you could go there and then they, it would have a, a listing of all teaching positions that or all positions that would be in schools that they could do that. So that would be something that you could check out. Okay, um, there was a I'm getting a message uh, privately, but there was a pre-submitted question about NTRP from one of our board members, and we would just want to know if uh, Dr. Lingo addressed it. And that's from Svay, if you're listening. Uh, from Dr. Cunningham. This is very informative. Thanks for the update. So glad to hear enrollment is on the increase. Yes, I am too, Dr. Cunningham. Thank you for participating. I hope everyone is doing well. I hope everyone stays safe and um, 
and I will hopefully I'll be able to see you in some form soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your time. We appreciate you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, Dean Lingo, if you're still on here, Lois does have a question. Because of the engagement of alumni and colleagues in the last two spring events highlighting faculty work, I would imagine there could be increased participation and excitement about the work. Congratulations on this presentation. That's Lois. Thank you, Lois. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan. Yes. Can you hear me? This is Savay Algar. Um, I had a question, yes, about the Multicultural Teacher Recruitment Program. Yes. We were, I was just asking you if, you if your question was answered. So you can go, Dean Lingo is still here if you'd like to ask her a question. Okay. I'm not sure I understand totally what that is. Is that for students who have graduated and they're trying to get a teaching job and they're uh, qualified, yes. oh, qualified under multicultural. So yes. what does that person do? Start at U of L or start at the Board of Education or what? Okay, MTRP is, a, is they would start at U of L. They can be an undergraduate student or they can be a graduate student, but that they are seeking initial teacher certification. So mm -hmm. I will ask Jonathan, Jonathan, can you check um, hang on just for the, Megan, can you let tell Dr. Leach that I am still on my advisory board and that he can, he'll have to wait. So Jonathan, can you connect her to Sherry Durham? Sure. Because she can talk about the specifics of um, like the degrees, because well, if they have already have an undergraduate degree, uh -huh. and we would do a transcript review to see what areas they could become certified to teach. And then, uh -huh would put those into an MAT program. So they would start with uh, the, the, they would start with us. Now, if they wanted to become alternatively certified, meaning that they want to get a job and teach, they wanted to teach, earn money while simultaneously working on their master's degree, we have an option for them as well, but it's separate from the MTRP program. But they could qualify for MTRP if they if they are in an underrepresented group. If that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, the situation is, I think he would like to get a job and work on his master's as he has a job, but he has his degree, but not teaching certification. Okay. Uh, it's a matter in Spanish. Oh, okay. So what he would do is, okay, if you would just email me his information, I will connect him with someone that can help walk him through the transcript review process. And we can look and see and give him some, uh, and tell him what areas that he would be qualified to teach. Okay. Should he meanwhile apply for a job teaching Spanish at the Board of Education? I know they have some openings, but I'm not sure they'll look for certified right. or so not. Right. So what they what he would have to do though is we would have to look at his transcript to see if he has a require and I'm sure he does with a minor, but in order for him to become emergency certified the, at U of L, we have to make sure that he meets the 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 requirements as outlined by the state for certification. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Who does so he need email to Jonathan? If you want to connect with Jonathan, then Jonathan can connect with sure. me. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you for well, thank, thank you, you for participating. Oh, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, Megan and Jonathan, I'm gonna hop off and hop hop on to my next one. So thank you, thank you both, and I'll touch base with you, Megan, at four thirty, I think. Yep. Okay. Great job, Dean Lingo. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. We have so, any follow up, Marianne?